Kings chapter number 18. We'll begin reading at verse number 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal be God, then follow Him. And the people answered Him not a word. And Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces. Lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And call you on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves. Dress it first, for you are many. Call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal. They prayed from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. They leaped on the altar which was made, It came to pass around noon, Elijah began to mock them. I like a little smart aleck preacher, don't you? (laughs) And he said, cry loud, for he's a God. Maybe he's talking, or he's on a journey, or he's pursuing, or maybe he's asleep and you've got to wake him up. And they cried louder. They cut themselves after the manner with knives and lancet, and blood gushed from them. It came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied till the time of the evening sacrifice. There was no voice, no answer, none that regarded. And Elijah said to the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be my name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench about the altar, as great as it would contain two measures of seed. He put the wood in order. He cut the bullock in pieces, laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water. Pour it on the sacrifice. And on the wood. He said to them, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. A third time. They did it a third time. And it came to pass that the water ran about the altar and he filled the trench with water. Came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you turn their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I see this passage of Scripture 
And as we talked about this morning, Elijah was a man of prayer. James, when he tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, tells us about Elijah the prophet. Elijah is a wild kind of character. He strolls in out of nowhere and comes in front of the king and says, there's going to be no rain on the land but according to my word. He does this coming into Israel, going in front of King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, and says these words to Israel who believes they are the chosen people of God because they are the seed of Abraham. But it tells us that Elijah was a Tishbite. He was not from Israel. He was a Gentile. They would have looked down their nose at him. They would even be offended that he would presume to speak for the God of Israel because he was an outsider. But sometimes when the church becomes apathetic, God has to send in a voice from the outside to wake us up so that we can hear clearly from God. They had taken the worship of God. And all the sacrifices and the worship, they had combined it with the religion of the land. They still did what the law of Moses said with the sacrifices and the worship. They still worshiped the Lord in the temple. And because of this, they felt like they were, they were still the people of God. But with all of the God worship, it had become corrupted. Because in their place to worship Jehovah, they'd also set up a little statue to Baal. They would worship the gods of Canaan, the idols. And it wasn't that they had in their heart forsaken the worship of Jehovah, but they had mixed it up so much that it was no longer worship at all. It had become idolatry. I wonder how much we have tinkered around with. And over time have got some kind of blended mixed cocktail that is a little bit of Americanism and a little bit of Christianity. And it's neither. How much do we hear the gospel that is being preached sound a whole lot like the American dream? It's about material stuff. The end, the end result, the end goal of all of what God wants to do in redemption and salvation and His Spirit in our life is about what happens in your bank account or what happens with your house or your car or your finances. And we've tinkered around with the message of the Gospel so that we've watered it down and we've got some blended mixed cocktail that's not what the Scripture says. We've set up idols of Baal. We've set up idols of materialism. We've bowed our knee at stuff that doesn't matter. So Elijah, he says to the people, how long will you straddle the fence? I'm telling you, we're living in a day where you're going to need to choose. There's a lot of middle ground that we have made that's going to go away. We've had middle ground where you can be friendly with Christianity and still embrace the world. I've heard folks say, well, talking about their favorite sin. You know, I get up here and I can preach against homosexuality and you guys would probably amen and cheer me on because there's, there's not a whole lot of us in here struggling with that one. 
But when it, when it comes to whatever it is that's our favorite sin, I've heard folks say things like, well, God understands. He does understand. As if that the Lord is giving us a free pass. That you get two sins that you're allowed to hold on to. As long as you don't take on three, you'll be okay. But Elijah says to the people, How long will you halt between two opinions? That you can't go on with this middle ground of compromise. That it's no longer acceptable. This is the moment where we have to decide if we're going to worship Baal, then let's forget church, let's forget Jesus, and let's worship that. But if we're going to worship the Lord, then let's forsake the world and with wholeheartedness say, the Lord is God and we serve Him alone. Amen. How long will you hold on to both? How long will we straddle? How long will we live with indecision? How much will we live with compromise? We're coming to a day where that's not going to be possible. Hear me. It's not the end game for the enemy to just make sin permissible. And acceptable. You can look at other countries where this has happened. Do you know in Canada, if you read from Corinthians or Romans on the radio, you could be put in jail for a hate crime? As a preacher said last night, there's already lawsuits against Bible publishers for publishing hate speech because they print the Bible. The end game of the enemy, you can see it in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, either you worship the Antichrist and the false prophet and the false religion of this world, or you serve God. And you stand for what is true and what is righteous. There is coming a day on this earth when we will no longer be able to try to hold on to both. We really never were able to do that. We were, delu- we were deceived and in delusion thinking that it was possible to be Christian and still hold on to these material values and this worldliness. But God is calling for His people as He spoke through the prophet Elijah over centuries ago. How long will you halt? How long will you try to hold on? How long will you be undecided? How long will you be half committed? How long will you be lukewarm? Or will you serve God? If the Lord be God, let's serve Him. That's how Elijah begins this. This what, 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 what unfolds as a spiritual awakening, a breakthrough, a transformation for the country. All of this begins with the big question. Which will you choose? Can't have both. Can't hold on to both. We can't love anything more than Him. Jesus, He said some really hard things. He said, can't love your father, your mother, your sister, your brother more than me. Man says, well, Lord, let me go back and bury my father and then I'll fall. He said, let the dead bury the dead. There is such passionate, intense commitment. Just as God spoke to Abraham and said, give me your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. God is calling for us to give to him the thing that is most dear, that is most close to our heart and lay it on the altar. How long will we halt? How long will we compromise? What if we live in a day where to serve God means you may go to jail? What if we live in a day where they outlaw Bibles because they say it's hate speech? 
and they try to take your Bibles away. You don't think that can happen? That's where the enemy wants this thing to go. It's that way in China. The Bi- it's illegal to own a copy of the Scripture. The way they get Bibles into Iraq and Iran and China, Christian missionaries smuggle them in. To be caught with a Bible can mean concentration camps or execution. I don't know that that's what's going to happen in this country, but we have to have such fervent commitment to the things of God that even if it cost us our life, even if it cost us persecution, that we're willing to say, I sell out to you, Lord. How long will you halt between two opinions? That's where Elijah made them realize there's no more Middle ground. No more middle ground. We're called as Christians sometimes the far right, extremist, fundamentalist. Why don't you go to the middle of the road? Compromise a little bit. There's no more dangerous place to be than in the middle of the road. You want to stand in the middle of the road, you you got a death wish. But Elijah here is saying, pick one. It's what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. I don't want you lukewarm. Pick one. Either serve God or hate Him. There's no middle ground. Either love God or hate Him. Either choose righteousness or choose evil. I heard Jesse Duplantis talk about some Christians came to him and they were like, well, it's okay, brother, to drink wine. Christians can drink wine. He's like, when I was a sinner, I drank and I got drunk. If I want to live that life, I'll live that life. But if I want to serve the Lord, I don't want to dabble with a little bit. Don't see how much we can compromise with, how much we can get away with, but instead understand that if we commit ourselves wholly to the Lord, sanctified, set apart, sold out to Him, that's when God moves among His people. Elijah made them real to realize that there is there's no compromise. And I would submit that to you tonight, that there is... No compromise. There's no middle. Either we serve God or we don't. Next thing Elijah did is he repaired the broken altar. He repaired the broken altar. The altar was not only a place of prayer, but the altar of the Old Testament was a place of sacrifice. I think when we have an altar call, maybe we've got it upside down. And we think we come to the altar to receive. But the altar is a place where you give. The altar is a place where something dies. The altar is a place of sacrifice. And maybe in some of that mixed up cocktail we've got, we want everything to be about blessing. Come to the altar so we can be blessed. But Elijah repaired the altar. I think for us to see what God wants to do, that we've got to first repair our understanding of what the altar is. The altar is not a place where we come with a gimme, gimme, gimme list. 
The altar is a place where we lay it all down for the Lord. Where we lay ourselves. Paul said, I submit to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you give your bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable worship. God's plan is that we lay ourselves on the altar that we crucify our flesh, that we die there. He repaired the altar that was broken down. The altar was broken down. How how was the altar broken down? It could have been broken down by the enemies of God attacking it. Or the altar may have broken down just from time and neglect. You could build an altar, but if it sits out there in the elements long enough, storms, rain, weather, winds, what was once built crumbles. Neglect. Not paying attention to it. Repair. The broken altar. The, 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 the altar that had been broken, Elijah repaired it. And I, I, we, we talked this morning about prayer. And I think as we look at how do we build our personal altar? How do we rebuild the altar of this church? It's important that we all pray and spend time with God. How do you build that altar? You know, Everybody connects with God in different ways. There there, there are some folks that they pray best. Their best prayer meetings is when we're with, with other people. When they join together and pray. They pray and they can sense the presence of God when they're praying with somebody else. If you are building your altar. You've got to find what way do you pray and seek God best. How do you connect with the Holy Spirit? How do you connect with God? You know, I was learning to pray when I was a teenager. I I heard a message a guy said, you just got to learn to spend the time in prayer. And I don't know about you, but I was learning to pray. Every time I would kneel down and pray, It wouldn't be too long until I fell asleep. I'd be snoring. So I heard this preacher said he did something crazy. He got up and he stood on the edge of his bathtub. And he prayed standing on the edge of his bathtub. Because if you fall asleep then, you'll wake up real quick. (laughs) And I tried that. I tried praying on the edge of my bathtub. I learned that I don't pray well kneeling down. I like to pray walking. I've scared some folks. I I, I remember one of the first revivals. I helped the pastor invited us to come and have prayer meeting the night before the revival. And he canceled the revival after one service after he saw the kind of crazy way that me and a couple of friends prayed. But we, we prayed. We were, we were young. We, we got up and jumped up and down on the seats and we smeared oil all over the place. And, but I, I like to walk and pray. If I kneel down and pray, you'll find me asleep. I can't stay still that long. I gotta be moving. Other people pray better if they're praying with worship music going behind them. Maybe you pray better if, if you get out and you're out in the mountains and out in the trees or out in nature and you're just talking to God that way. You've got to find how do you build your altar? How do you connect with the Holy Spirit? What way are you able to seek God and to stay in His presence? You don't have to pray like somebody else. You don't have to find some formula. You can try, what, try a few of these things and see how do you connect with the Spirit of God What does God bless you with when you pray? 
But Elijah, he repaired the altar. I think if we were to look at our spiritual altars, they may have been broken down. There may be some neglect. Is there an altar in our home? Is there an altar in our family? Do you sit down with your family and pray together? Not just blessing your food. I mean pray together. You get some lost people in your family, I'm telling you, it is a great way for the Holy Spirit to convict them. You just lay hands on them and start praying, pray in tongues, let the Holy Ghost move. My son called, he used to hate that. Now he's on fire for the Lord. Now he's doing it to his brother. You've got to build an altar. Repair the altar. You've got to keep it in shape. You've got to keep an altar for yourself, an altar for your family. And God help us. We need an altar built spiritually in this church that we seek the face of God, that we pray, that we don't let prayer be something on the back burner, but it is a house of prayer that the Lord inhabits. Elijah repaired the altar. Then he does something that seems a little ridiculous. He's praying for fire. He's believing for fire. But before he has that prayer, he soaks everything With water. Now, you look at that and you think, maybe Elijah's not all there. Is he a little off his rocker? If he'd soaked it with kerosene, lighter fluid, oil, you could understand why he's preparing for the fire. But when you understand what God says in the book of Leviticus, He tells His people, see, God sent the fire that was on the altar in the tabernacle. God sent that fire down. And He commanded the people that the fire on the altar shall never Go out. And they had to remove the ash. They had to keep the fire tended to. And for hundreds of years in the tabernacle, they kept the same fire that the Lord sent. In fact, in Leviticus, the Lord said, Never shall you offer strange fire. So if the fire went out on the altar, the command of God was, you don't just go and find you a match. You don't find another fire and put it on the altar. There's only one fire that was to burn on the altar. So Elijah, as he's soaking this altar and this sacrifice with water, he wants everyone to know That the fire that is on this altar that comes. This is not a sleight of hand. This isn't something that I've put there. This is something that God has sent. 
I'm here to tell you tonight that what we need in this community, what we need in this church, what we need in our country is not some fire, strange fire stroked by man. We don't need another program, another idea, another creative marketing tool. What we need is the fire of Pentecost to come once again. It's the same fire. We need it to fall from heaven. We don't need to stir up our own fire. We don't need to try to work up our own revival. What we need is for God to send His fire on this church again. What we need is for God to send His fire on our lives again. We need the real fire from heaven to fall on the people of God. And God sent the fire. He sent it. I'm telling you, I I, I can't emphasize this enough. This is what God is really just pounding home for me is that we don't need to ask God to bless what we do. We need to do what God will bless. If we will do what God says to do, His blessings will follow us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, David said. If we will repair the altar, if we will choose to serve the Lord and He only. If we will ask God to send His fire, God will do what He's promised He would do. They didn't start with the fire though. They started with separation. They started with rebuilding the altar. They started with drowning any carnality or fleshly works with water. So that they would know that what came, came from God. That's what we need. We need to see God's fire come. And when God sends it, there's no question about it. Get on on one of my little soapboxes here. I hear folks and I hear preaching that talks about well you come and you pray to be healed. Just claim it. Don't speak that sickness on yourself. Honey, when God heals you, you know you're healed. You don't need to pretend like you're healed. If God touches you, there's no doubt that you have been touched by the Lord. Jesus didn't lay hands on people and said, Now go home claiming your healing. They were healed. And they knew it. And He said things to them like, Go show yourself to the priest. He'll verify that you're healed. Go check it out with the doctor. They'll run tests and they'll know you're healed. We don't need to say, well, I believe I'm healed. Let me go ahead and flush my medication and do crazy things like that. If God heals you, you'll know that you've been healed. If God sends a fire from heaven, you'll know it's God. If God moves, you'll know it's God. We don't need to just say it's God and pretend like God is moving. We need to pray until God moves. And we know we prayed through and we've seen the fire of God fall from heaven on our church and on our home and on our community. God sent the fire. And look what happens when God sent the fire. People that were unbelievers, that were deceived by the cocktail religion of the day, that were worshiping Baal, said, you know what? The Lord, He is God. I think sometimes we try to convince people with an argument. When the only way they're going to be convinced is when God moves. You can't argue somebody into salvation. If somebody's deceived, there's no sense in arguing. It doesn't do any good to argue with someone about uh, about Scripture if they don't believe the Scripture. 
It doesn't do any good to try to argue the, the, the people of this world into believing the things that we see and hold dearly from the Scripture. But if God moves, blindness and scales from eyes are falling. Eyes are open. People can hear. People can see. And the deception is rolled back because the power of God changes them. There's some things that only God can change. And right now we stand at a point in time where the only thing that will change our country is a move of God. And the only thing that we can do is get on our knees, build an altar, and let God do what we can't do on our own. I believe when I see this happen. Sin was removed from the camp. Deception was turned. In a moment, suddenly, people that had been deceived and in idolatry for a lifetime, in a moment, were changed. Their eyes were opened. They went from serving Baal to forsaking idolatry putting to death all the false prophets, making Jezebel mad, all of it in a moment. Would to God that we see that fire fall from heaven in our, in our land. I believe God could still do it. And it wouldn't matter what the Supreme Court says the law is. If we have revival in the hearts of people, they won't want sin. There was a prayer revival that happened in Ireland in the 1850s. It shut down the mines. Because all of the mules were used to listening to commands that were cuss words. And everybody that was working in the mines got saved and quit cussing. And they had to retrain the mules how to work without somebody cussing you. What God can do when He sends revival. What God will do if we'll let Him send it here. I believe it. Our church, our movement was started in the fires of revival. You know that? There's churches where they, 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 the community called the fire department because they saw flames on the building. And the fire department came and it was the Holy Ghost. God can send His fire on His people. He can make it a testimony to the community so that all that are lost, all that are outside, can see the power of God working in His people in the church. God is calling us tonight to have the same moment that Elijah had on Mount Carmel. Where we say enough with compromise. Amen. We're not going to let the altar be broken down. And we're going to see God's fire come to